Hello my friends. We are back in Alabama once again and we are in Montgomery today to pay homage, just like we mentioned two days ago, to the late great hillbilly poet Hank Williams. Today I'm going to show you many of his personal artifacts. We're going to go to his grave and we're going to explore the man that made country music, hillbilly music, western music, whatever you want to call it. Made it an art form. Days with Jordan the Lion, Talking Hank, begins now. Right here in dead center of Montgomery, right in front of the river walk, we have an amazing statue to the man. Look at that, he's even wearing a nudie suit. I'll zoom in so you can get a little bit of a detail on that suit, but look at that, man, that is amazing. See all the music notes and everything on there? And it's spitting image of Hank. Look at that. Get real close in there. This is really, I guess, you know, we saw the other day where he learned how to play, but it was really once the family moved here when he was 14 that it all changed because it was Hank's time here at Montgomery that he would learn to drink, he would be performing on a radio show, he put together his first band, He'd marry Audrey. A lot happened here. I mean, this was the days when he got that radio show and he was, he had basically, you know, because of World War II, they needed people in the factories and Hank had a, had a bad back issue that kept him from being in the military. So he was working in shipyards and then started performing in the, uh, the evening time. It was starting to get pretty popular and, uh, his mom was basically the driving force behind a lot of this. They said that old Lily was, you know, she controlled every aspect of his life. And in a lot of ways, the people that knew Hank said that's what he needed. And that's why when he met Audrey, she was perfect because she was that same personality. And as you might imagine, Audrey and Lily did not get along very well because they were both domineering, controlling people. But it's thanks to both of them. Lily's driving letting him know that he had talent and he had to keep sticking with it. And it was Audrey's drive and knowing that he was talented and inspiring those songs. They said they had a very, very tumultuous relationship. I mean, downright violent. But um, they, in a way, they said that Hank needed that because as a songwriter, you sometimes get lazy and you need people to inspire things, good or bad. And Audrey definitely did that. I mean, all the way down to the boots. So the family lived here, I mean he lived here up until even he and Audrey got a divorce and then got it an old a year later and got back together they were they were here at Montgomery until he took off and was doing all the hayride stuff in Shreveport. So now they have a museum here in town that we're going to check out and Hank and Audrey are both buried here in Montgomery. So let's go more explore more of Hank and the museum actually has the very car that Hank died untimely at the age of 29 in the back seat of going from one town to the next to perform on the back of the statue this is great it says hank williams jr wishes to thank the following for their special contribution for making this statue possible and i think hank jr says it best he said you want to know anything about my daddy just listen to the music he said everything in those songs you don't need a biography you don't need an autobiography he said it all right there and you'll also see something that Hank Jr. had to put near the grave site. Um, it's sad that he had to do this, but I'll show you when we get out there what he did and why he did it. So the museum to Hank Williams that we're going to see today, since we saw a different one two days ago, the one we're going to see today is built in an old boarding house. And that's the one that has the death car of Hank Williams Sr. You know, if we're going to talk Montgomery, I guess we can also say you can add this town to another list of things that Hank did first here, and that was... Like I said, drink. He also quit school here when he was 16 years old in the 10th grade. He left school to continue performing all the time and uh, they would give you free drinks when you did that. And they said Hank couldn't just have one drink and he also couldn't handle much more than one drink. So this became something that he dealt with throughout his life. He said he would go on a four or five day bender and then quit drinking for two weeks and then one little thing would set him off again. And so this is just something that you know, it was partially brought on by Audrey, but that's partially what a lot of the problems were, his drinking. And, uh, you know, that's 
sad life of an artist tends to always be some vice that they just can't quit. Check that out. A water tower right here in town. Water tower lofts. I don't really know if I even need to mention any of his songs. I think everybody probably knows I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry and Kalijah and Move It On Over. <laughs> Howling at the Moon, that's another good one. You got me chasing rabbits, pulling my hair and howling at the moon. People that know Hank said that he didn't really trust anybody other than his band and his mother. I mean, even Audrey to an extent, he you know just couldn't trust anyone. Now this is really interesting. Right next to this building, this historic building that I'm gonna tell you about is the Hank Williams Museum right there. But what's right next to it? Let me show you. So warehouses used in the slave trade. Commerce Street was a central to the operation of Montgomery slave trade. Enslaved people were marched in chains up the street from the riverfront and railroad station to the slave auction site or to local slave depots. Warehouses were critical to the city's slave trade. Slave traders confined enslaved people in warehouses until they could be sold during the slave auctions. Wow. This location, 122 Commerce Street, was a very large warehouse owned by John Murphy who provided support to the slave traders in the city and built the Murphy House. Wow. So, yeah, that's what that is. And the river walk is straight down there so they would have been marched up this street. Well, thank God times change, but let's go in and take a look at this museum. I have heard from friends that have been here, they said, you're gonna flip out, dude. They have some really, really great stuff, some really great memorabilia here. And I'm already seeing some amazing t-shirts, and that's always a, a huge seller for me. Well, take a look, they have Kalijah right here as soon as you walk in. All right, here we go. There's one of Hank's guitars and one of his lap steels. Well, there's the car. This is said that Hank Jr. drove it for three years later on, but this is the one that Hank died in, in that back seat right there. That's Hank's suit. There's Hank's ring, and they said that Thurston Moore donated that from Sonic Youth. I think it's the same Thurston Moore. That's the original film of his funeral. There's his last ride trail. The death of Hank is told. There's Hank's reel-to-reel -reel machine from his house. And that is Hank's saddle. These are things that were found in the death car. His shaving kit, some smokes, a gun, those slippers and that suit he was wearing when he died. And they found that suitcase in the trunk. That's one of his nudie suits from the Grand Old Opry before anybody was wearing those kind of things. And his boots and his violin. His blue suede shoes. It says that's Hank Cedar chest and he signed it on the inside. All right, let's take off to visit Hank's grave. Kind of intermittently been getting rain all day. Hopefully it'll kind of let up. It's not really doing much right now, but hopefully by the time we get over there, it'll still be like this. I wonder if that's bare lumber after Bear Bryant. Wouldn't surprise me. We've made it to the cemetery and they even named it after Hank. And you can see down there it says, Praise the Lord, I Saw the Light. That was one of his best songs. And it's one of those songs that, um. When he was in pain, when he was at his saddest, he would sing that song. Now I heard it could be kind of tricky to find him, but if you just drive all the way straight back, they say that there's a sign back there that kind of points to where he's at. 
Now, since it's called Hank Williams Circle, you'd think that you'd have to take this circle to find it, and I believe you do. So here they are in one of the biggest plots I've ever seen at any cemetery. This one with all the AstroTurf, and I'm almost backing across the street just to fit it all in. That's Audrey and Hank's grave. I guess for eternity they will be laying side by side, bickering and loving on each other. Now you'll notice that uh, right here, it's not a headstone, but it's a request. And I mentioned this earlier, please do not desecrate the sacred spot. Many thanks, Hank Williams Jr. The reason that's here is because if you look at Hank's grave here, you can see his cowboy boots right there. God love you, Hank. If you look at his grave right over here, from what I understand online, a few things are missing. Originally, there was a pair of boots and a couple of vases there for flowers, and they've been stolen. So, it's another one of the reasons that uh, Hank put that there was also because they said that uh, at one point, you'll notice that the corners are shaved off of here. Well, they say the reason that is is because people came out here and tried to steal this at one point. They're wrapping a chain around it and trying to drag it with a with a truck. So they cut the corners off so that there would be no way for the the chain, I guess, to to go around it. I guess that's kind of what they said. Here he is, Luke the Drifter. Now, the reason I mentioned those boots and the vase and they were stolen and everything is because I don't know if this is true, but this is what I heard online. I saw it online and listed a couple of places that originally this were, uh, that was an original Hank hat that they covered in granite. I don't know if that's true or not, but you can see all around his tombstone, it's all of his great songs. Kalijah, which was the story of a local Indian who fell in love and they weren't allowed to be together and they took off and they always said that you know, if you listen to Hank's song about Kalijah, they always kept a wooden Indian at the doorway of Kalijah. I'll never get out of this world alive. You and me both, brother. Hey, good looking, we all know that song. We all know Jambalaya. Cold, cold heart. That was a hit because Tony Bennett covered it. Can you believe that? Then you got Luke the Drifter. That's, that's essential. I just told mama goodbye. These men with broken hearts. That's a great song. That's a Luke the Drifter song. Also, you can hear Ramblin' Man on there and Hello Joe. Hey Joe, the song about Stalin. There's the mansion on the hill. Long Gone Lonesome Blues. He had a hit with that too and that wasn't even his song. He just kind of did his own version of it. Your cheating heart. Actually, I think Long Gone Lonesome Blues was, but Lovesick Blues wasn't his song. I can't help it. It's kind of crazy is I'm So Lonesome I Can Cry is maybe one of the most famous songs and one of the saddest songs of all time. And that wasn't even the single. When it was released, that was the B-side to My Bucket's Got a Hole in It. So as we get closer to the headstone, you can see there's light coming from the heavens. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. There's Hank right there. Luke the Drifter himself. And over here we have Audrey. After Hank passed away, she kept the house that they had in Nashville. And anybody who was anybody, like Elvis, Fats Domino, just anybody who loved Hank, asked to come and see where Hank lived. So she kind of had a, a shrine, almost like a museum of a bunch of his things on display there that people that were, you know, invited or of notoriety you just couldn't go as a fan she would have all those and let them come visit so when we go to nashville i'm gonna go visit that house because after she sold it she had added on to it and things over time after she sold it i believe tammy wynette lived in it and tammy wynette ended up dying in it so here on the back side the kids have left messages to their parents well this one is from the kids. You can see from Lucretia, 
Dear mother, you were always there when I really needed you. You were the one I counted on. When you died, my world changed. I felt lost. I owe everything to you and daddy. There's no way to say I love you both enough. Your loving daughter, Lucretia. And below it, it says, my dearest mother, you like daddy left too soon. You have beautiful grandchildren. I will teach them about you. We miss you every day, especially me, your son, Hank Jr. And that was, his career got started real young. I mean, Hank Jr. got started pretty much as soon as he could play because Audrey had that same thing about her that Lily did where she saw talent and ushered it, helped um, push it to its potential. And so when he was just a kid, he was out performing as the son of Hank Williams doing Hank songs and making a name for himself. And then later on when he did his own music, I was like nothing like Hank Sr. So this message on the back of Hank's tombstone is from Audrey. It says, thank you, darling. Thank you for all the love you gave me. There could be no one stronger. Thank you for the many beautiful songs. They will live long and longer. Thank you for being a wonderful father to Lucretia. She loved you more than you knew. Thank you for our precious son and thank God he looks so much like you. Now I say, there are no words in the dictionary that can express my love for you. Someday beyond the blue, Audrey Williams. Lucretia was, Audrey had been married before Hank and Lucretia was her baby before she had Hank, or before she met Hank and Hank loved her like his own, raised her like his own and um, when they met and she got a divorce, Hank and Audrey got married 10 days after the divorce. They believe the cause of Hank's death was actually a disease. Um, and it was a disease that they said that they believe he had because it afflicted people exactly matching him. Tall, lanky, skinny, with teeth too close together, back problems, and heart trouble. Um, they said that was synonymous for uh, people with those characteristics to not have a long life. And uh, fortunately, Hank was taking all those painkillers and drinking and uh, and then on the way to his next gig, died in the back seat of his car. Now I wonder if Hank Jr. will be buried here. I hope so, who knows? But this is truly a family plot because right here, Audrey and Hank, right beside him his mother, Lillian Skipper Williams. Thank you, Lillian. Without you, we probably never would've got any of Hank's music to begin with. Then right next to her is Irene, Hank's older sister. And she sadly ended up in prison. She, uh, I guess long story short was that she thought she knew the people that she was in a car with and they were going to Mexico and the, the trunk ended up being filled with cocaine. She spent 10 years in prison, kind of innocently. There was her husband, JT Smith, and then their baby, Charlotte. Well, God bless you, Hank. There really will never be another quite like you. I don't know if anybody, I don't think any blues man or anybody can ever make a song hurt the way you did. I just, that was, you transcended music. It was, it was poetry that jumped out of the speakers, jumped out of the guitar, and just pulled your heart out and squeezed it. And thank you for the showmanship too, man, because, you know, until you were wearing nudie suits and dancing around, there just, there wasn't anything like that in country music. Thank you everyone for watching. We're gonna call it a night here. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Still I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light.